Ni hao to y'all. Welcome back to another episode of Gong Fu Tea Cha, a very long awaited and anticipated episode because this one is about yellow tea, which is very mysterious and exotic. Actually, even in China, yellow tea is somewhat mysterious and exotic because a lot of Chinese people have not actually tried yellow tea, and definitely a lot of people in the West have never tried yellow tea. Yellow tea may be considered rare. Yellow tea is also confusing because there's a couple of different things called yellow tea and I will disambiguate throughout the course of this presentation. But suffice it to say, yellow tea is a rare type of tea because it is very difficult to make and it is my understanding that there once were many more kinds of yellow tea throughout China than there are now. But yellow tea, unlike many other types of tea like green tea, or puar tea did not easily translate or scale up when we started uh, automating and uh, making more industrial the process of making tea. So because it didn't scale up in this industrial way, it got kind of left behind during the modernization of the tea industry in China. That said, we love that because that means yellow tea is by and large intensively handmade and for that reason, we have lots of different yellow teas that are now produced in extremely small batches and it's extremely small amounts. And because of that rarity and also a lot of misunderstanding about what yellow tea is and that it's something different than green tea, you have a lot of people have not encountered it before. Starting with what yellow tea is, huang cha, yellow tea, can be used in two ways. Huang cha, yellow is also the color of the emperor. And so anything with Huang in it, yellow, was associated with the emperor. And so you see in the literature references to Huang Cha that don't necessarily have anything to do with the process of making the tea. It means it was tribute tea, it was for the emperor. And so you have, a, you have references to something called Huang Cha throughout the Chinese literature that may not always refer to what we are gonna talk about tonight as yellow tea being one of the big categories of tea on par with green tea or white tea or red tea etc. So the second use of the word huang cha, yellow tea, is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And it refers to a category of tea wherein the leaves are lightly oxidized. In fact, it's very similar to green tea, except for that extra level of oxidation. Remember, green tea, we want to be as unoxidized as possible. Yellow tea, we're going to let it oxidize a little bit. And we're going to do that in a very well-controlled, artisanal, intensive process that we're gonna talk more about later. But the reason that people make yellow tea in this way, as opposed to green tea, is because it takes some of the edge off the green tea. And what I mean by this is it takes off some of that chlorophyll -y, grassy taste, some of the sweetness, some of that astringency, and it, to the Chinese mind, some of the coldness of green tea. Green tea has a reputation for being cooling in the Chinese medical paradigm, we talk about foods and teas as being warming or cooling, depending on their qi. And people of certain constitutions, especially older people, uh, don't want to drink something or eat something that has a cooling effect. People who already have a cool constitution don't want to consume things like green tea or sheng puar, um, or during certain times of their lives, during certain times of the year, certain times of the month, when they're already in a state where they're in a cold state, they will avoid cooling foods and cooling beverages, including green tea. And yellow tea, because it has, been, has gone through that yellowing process and that chlorophyll -y cooling quality has been muted and has become oxidized and turned into that yellow color and that yellow character, it has a little bit more warmth to it and it has a little bit less of that cooling quality and therefore it's sought after being better for digestion and better for people who are trying to avoid those cooling foods. So, how do we make yellow tea? It's very, very similar as making green tea, but there's an extra step called men huang. Men means to stew or steam. And the process it refers to, men means to stew or steam, huang means yellow. And so when you're, you're men huanging it, you are keeping the tea either covered or uncovered, but in a warm, humid environment. And the humidity and the temperature of the environment are controlled by braziers of charcoal uh, and fans and water, bowls of water to add humidity to the room. And so they, through this kind of traditional process, they maintain the humidity in the room. The most traditional kinds of yellow tea are gonna use this traditional process to hit the ideal temperature and humidity. And the tea in this state 
A good way to think of this process is you take a head of cabbage, fresh head of cabbage, it's green. You put it in the crisper of your refrigerator. The crisper is a sealed, not tight sealed, it's not a hermetically sealed, but it's a more or less sealed environment. And it's an environment that while it's not warm, it's designed to be cool and, and, and to, to prevent this process from happening over a long enough time, say a week or so, that head of cabbage will yellow or lettuce. People use lettuce, lettuce does it faster. So imagine lettuce getting a little bit of yellow in your fridge. The point is you've got some kind of green vegetable and it's turning yellow and it's in your crisper and it's in this kind of humid environment where all of the moisture escaping from it is staying in its immediate environment. And so when we are doing the Munhuang process, we are containing it, uh, enveloping it in some way, either in a temperature humidity controlled room or in a little box or covering it in some way to maintain that ambient humidity as the tea dries out. It is not being dried out with air passing over it. And so it's this kind of like withering when we talk about white tea and withering, except that withering is going to happen with air passing over it outdoors and it is not going to be munning. It's not going to be stewing in that way and you're not going to get that yellowing effect, that oxidation. So we are intentionally oxidizing the tea without massaging it, without baking it, without anything like that. We're just letting it rest in a warm, humid environment. And why it's not warm, uh, the crisper is not warm, the crisper is cold. So if we were to warm up the crisper, that yellowing process would happen really fast. That would defeat the, process, the purpose of a crisper in a refrigerator, but it would be a good yellow tea manufacturing tool if you did have such a refrigerator. Um, there are still yellow teas in China, all spread all over. They're not localized to any one particular place. You see them in Sichuan, you see them in Hunan, you see them in Hubei, you see them in Anhui, Guizhou. So there's a couple of different places all across China, kind of like green tea and red tea, where you see them occurring all over the place. They're not like Oolong or Puar, where they're hyper-localized to a specific spot. And one of the reasons that yellow tea is so rare, my understanding, is that only one master can manage one lot of yellow tea, one harvest of yellow tea, one batch of yellow tea. Only one master can handle that because if you have two different masters producing two different batches, you're fundamentally producing two different teas. Anyway, they would be different enough that you couldn't just blend them together and hope to get something with a, a unified and well-defined character. You'd be blending two things that were too different because this Munhuang process is so precise and also organic and idiosyncratic, by, by which I mean there are, 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 the master is not adhering to certain specific physical standards. They're using their experience and their intuition to process this tea. And so for that reason, yellow tea, when it's traditionally produced, which it pretty much all is because you can't, I've tried, I tried yellow tea on Mengding Mountain. I tried a cheap Huangya on Mengding Mountain where some people got cute and thought they'd figure out an automated way to make yellow tea and it just didn't even count at all. It was just not anything like the real Mengding Huangya um, at all. And so it, it quickly emerged to me that in fact, you really can't fake it. Yellow tea is one of these types of tea that you can't fake it. You have to have one experienced master producing this tea and that's just the way it is. The most famous yellow tea is called Junshan Yinzhen, which mean, Junshan is, means gentleman mountain, uh, scholar mountain. And it's an island in the middle of Dongtinghu, Dongting Lake, which is China's biggest lake, I guess, or classical China's biggest lake. And it's right between the provinces of Hunan and Hubei. You probably have heard of uh, uh, both of those provinces. And uh, Hunan means south of the lake and Hubei means north of the lake. And that's how those provinces are named. And the lake that they're talking about is Dongting Lake right in the middle. And in the middle of that lake is an island. And on that island, they grow a type of tea called Junshan Yinzhen. You've heard me say Yinzhen before. If you watch the white tea episode, Yinzhen means silver needle and refers to the downy white buds that are usually used to make white tea. In this case, it refers to a yellow tea. So Junshan Yinzhen, Junshan silver needle is a yellow tea. Bai Hao Yinzhen, white hair silver needle is a white tea but they're both made with just the buds. And so they're similar in that sense. 
I don't have Junshan Yunjun today because I have not, this, the, they're not done this year and it's a tea that you get in the spring. Uh, but I do have some of last year's uh, yellow teas that I still have, although the new yellow teas for 2021 have not come in. So I'll be demonstrating with those today. Junshan Yunjun is the most famous yellow tea. I was at one of the biggest Junshan Yunjun processing facilities on Junshan and any, you can't grow it outside of Junshan. They grow yellow tea outside of Junshan, but they, it's not real Junshan Yunjun. It is counterfeit or it's called something else. Um, and they produce 120 kilos a year. That is the maximum amount they can produce of Junshan Yunjun. And this is a big, like, formerly government owned Junshan Yunjun company. It's one of the biggest ones. And they only produce 120 kilos a year and they are only having their tea processed by a single master. So even at the upper echelons of production of these teas, they're not so famous that people are mad, mad counterfeiting them to the same degree that you see with something like Longjing, where you have, that's so well known. Longjing, they only produce a small amount per year also, but it's so well known that there's tons and tons of counterfeiting going on. The yellow teas are very niche and they are not popular enough yet to the point where I have encountered a lot of fake yellow teas. They're just usually rare and expensive and they're only for people who are really particularly into them. Today, we are going to start with a uh, Huangya. Mengding Huangya and Huashan Huangya are two very famous yellow teas. And Mengding Huangya is from Sichuan province, the famous Mengding mountain, which was one of the first sites of tea cultivation, intentional tea cultivation, um, and one of the uh, nodes of the old tea horse road, and also the, one of the radiation points of the Xiao Ye Zhong small leaf uh, cultivar tea plant, or small leaf family of tea plants that spreads out across China, as opposed to the Dai Ye Zhong big leaf tea plants of Yunnan. So Mengding Shan, very, very important place for tea. Also the home of Mengding Ganlu, sweet dew, a green tea. Also the home of uh, the Zhang Cha, the Tibetan tea that gets produced there and exported to Tibet, a Hei Cha. So you've got green tea, yellow tea, and Hei Cha all coming from Mengding Mountain. Really remarkable place for tea. Uh, and my contact there, Yang Chi, he has a temple, a 400 year old tea temple there that has an ancient well that goes back to the Tang Dynasty. The well is actually older than the temple. It's made of stone and it's got dragons. It's really neat. Really neat place. In fact, the interior walls of his upstairs of his tea temple are made of Hei Cha bricks, Zhang Cha bricks. So very magical place, Mengding Mountain, home to one of the most famous Huangya. What is a Huangya? Huangya means yellow sprout or yellow bud. And it refers to yellow teas that are all buds and they are pressed flat like this. Oop, yep. I was told to Dutch it a lot, and there I did. I Dutched it a lot, and I spelled some, but that is okay. Bloop. There's still enough to make tea with. Huangya refers to any tea, well, or most of the yellow teas in China that you see that fall into this paradigm where they are all buds, they are pressed flat into that little sparrow's tongue shape, are called Huangya. Incidentally, Junshan Yinzhan also looks like this. It's just not called a Huangya. It gets its own name, and they're a little bit longer. Those Junshan Yinzhan are a little bit longer than these kind of a little bit more chunky squat little leaves there. Uh, this one is not from Mengding, this is from Ma Bian. And so you have these Huangya teas being produced in a couple different places in China and they don't always have to look exactly like, they're all gonna have generally the same shape, they're all gonna be yellow teas and they'll be produced with some variation of this Munhuang process. This one is by our very dear friend, tea master and tea farmer, Hung Yi of Ma Bian, Sichuan. He uses wild tea plants to make his teas. If uh, you've heard me talk about Inner Sun or Welcoming Spring or Esmeralda in some of our other episodes, then he's the same guy who does those. Extremely talented young tea master and he studied on Mengding Shan. He went to Mengding Shan, which is not far from Ma Bian. They're both in Sichuan and he studied the technique for making this Huangya from Mengding and he applied it to his Ma Bian wild plant. So we're gonna start with that. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a, 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 a good steeping technique for this tea that can show off the, the beauty of these Danya, this is a Danya tea, all bud tea. Uh, the teas that are all buds have a really beautiful character whereby they float in the water very nicely. And that's, uh, they're often steeped in glass for this reason. So today I'm gonna to steep this in glass. Also, the 
Junshan Yinzhan, the most famous iteration of these very formal yellow teas, is called the dancing tea in China. They, that's its nickname because watching the leaves float up and down and then back up uh, is very beautiful in the glass. And so this is a feature of this tea is that it's known for being very aesthetic in the glass. I'm gonna use a two Gong Dao Bei method today, which is going to let us see these beautiful leaves doing their beautiful thing. And I love this tea. This tea is one of the most refreshing teas. This is something that I find about yellow teas. I'm gonna use some hot water here because we're doing this two gong dao bei method. I'm gonna let it sit there for a sec, soak up some of that water. And then I'm gonna pour it further in and uh, fill it up a little bit more and then you get to see the really beautiful dancing aspect of this tea. All right, and then as they settle, they float straight up and down, and Chinese people just freaking love it when tea floats straight up and down like that. They think it's the, the neatest thing. And so they'll serve teas like that in glass a lot of the time. And you see this with Taiping Hokwe, you see this with, I'm gonna warm up my cup. You see this with a lot of different kinds of tea that are all buds. And Huangya, these Huangya type teas, including Mengding Huangya, including Junshan Yinzhan, including this Mabian Huangya, and a couple other Huangyas that I've had the opportunity to sample uh, while I've been in China. What I love about them is that as opposed to green tea, which is sweet, yellow teas are dry, if that makes sense. That's not to say they can't ever be sweet, but that kind of fresh, grassy sweetness of green tea has mellowed and oxidized into this almost hay, straw, chocolatey, like cacao sort of character. And it has this very refreshing quality in the back of the throat, rather than that kind of astringency that you would get from green tea, where that astringency would be, you have this deeply satisfying, very refreshing, bright character to them. And yeah. I'll let this hang out for a second more. Also, because they are oxidized, yellow teas can steep for a lot longer than green teas without getting astringent because they lack that astringency. You can let them just chill in a glass like this. Normally, people would do this and they would uh, drink it right out of the glass. But this is uh, Gong Fu tea cha, not grandpa tea cha. It's called uh, grandpa style, is what people call it when you just drink out of the vessel that the leaves are steeping in. So we're gonna use this two gong da bei method. And I'm probably gonna get some leaves in here because I uh, did it in a haste while we're filming, but you get the idea. So I'm gonna go ahead and just decant this guy. And you can see we've got this beautiful golden soup. And I'll go ahead and give some smelling notes in just a second, but where it would be grassy notes or even those kind of floral notes in green tea have become more of a cacao-y, sweet grass, hay straw character. And also I'll get some nutty notes sometimes. Really, when you do this, you wanna let the leaves sit for much longer uh, in that first little soak of water. But, you know, we're trying to make an episode here. But I did keep most of the leaves in this first gongabe. There we go. Beautiful. And then, yeah, we've got snow peas. We've got 
that cacao, we have a little bit of like bean, like sweet red bean is, uh, or actually more like the sweet green bean. I don't know. For those of you out there who've had like Chinese desserts, sometimes they're made out of red beans or green beans. Those are two very popular sweet fillings. This one smells more like green beans than red beans. But again, not green beans like in the West, like green beans, like snapping green beans. This is um, mung beans, I guess, is what they are. But they're sweet in China. If you've had them, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm gonna pour myself some of this and then I'll go ahead and, for the purpose of seeing the soup here in these beautiful white mutton fat jade cups. There we go. Excellent. And then you get some of that freshness of green tea. It has the freshness of green tea, but it can't be described as being grassy. Hmm, yes, very nice, very nice. Yellow tea is, it's a very luxurious tea. I remember one time I was getting done with an event and someone, and it was like late at night, like three in the morning and I was cleaning up. I was, I was in a tea tent at a, a festival or something like that. And, and there was one serving of yellow tea that had already been scooped out and was ready to go, but no one used it. It was this one, it was this Wang Ya. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to drink this whole guy on full of yellow tea by myself. And I just stayed up for another like 30 minutes and sat there and just drank it right out of the guy one. I was like, this is my guy one full of yellow tea. I'm just going to get to drink this whole guy one full of yellow tea. All right, cool. I'm going to enjoy this later. So that's Wang Ya. Um, again, Junshan Yinjun is going to be in a similar family as Huang Ya. I'll probably put these guys over here. Boom. There we go. And then you've got other types of yellow tea. Often they get called Mao Jian. You've got other types of yellow tea throughout China. Um, some in Guizhou. Uh, I know that there's the uh, Haima Gongcha in Guizhou that uh, is very... Um, Sim, uh, a more informal style. And when you see these yellow teas end up resembling some kind of range between this formal style of these flattened sparrow's tongue shaped leaves to being an informal style that can look kind of like whatever, like including that vernacular Western green tea style of processing where the leaves are all kind of just in whatever shape they are without a very formal shaping process and more leaves and not just pure buds. And those often get called some kind of Mao Jian. And you'll probably remember us talking about Mao Jian from our green tea episode. Mao Jian, Mao Feng, these are terms used to refer to the hairiness and shape of the leaf. And they're used very generally throughout China uh, to refer to a lot of vernacular styles of tea that are produced in a local area that don't have any other particularities to them. They just get called Mao Feng or Mao Jian, usually green teas. And, in the, and some of these yellow teas also get called Mao Jian. And the only difference between them and a green Mao Jian is that they'll have gone through this Munhuang process. But again, that makes them much more rare and much more scarce. Um, I guess those are really the same thing, rare and scarce. But you don't see nearly as many of them. And an example of that that I have today is this is Lai Chi Gummy. That's not, you know, what they call it. They call it Duyun Huang Cha. Duyun is a county level city in Guizhou, uh, one of uh, the many lovely places in Guizhou that I had the pleasure of visiting with Miss Ray Liu of Grass People Tree, who is my guide, has been my guide and many other people's guide to the enchanting province of Guizhou. And I selected this one tonight because, A, because it does represent this informal, more Mao Jian type style um, that, you, that I'm referring to, but also because it represents an emergence of a novel few yellow teas. I've seen in the past couple years, I've seen new yellow teas emerging in places where they weren't before. This actually, this Ma Bian Huang Ya could be considered a novel yellow tea because it is being produced in a novel location. Ma Bian, 
previously yellow tea was not produced there. But when we talk about some of these yellow teas, especially from Guizhou, like this lychee gummy or uh, like uh, Lao Gongxiang, which is from Ray's master, uh, they are novel in the sense that they're not actually like other yellow teas that came before them. They don't follow a specific model because this Ma Bian Huang Ya is definitely an homage to Meng Ding Huang Ya, just made with different plants and in a different place. But this Lai Chi Gummy does not resemble any other yellow tea I've ever had. Neither does Lao Gongxiang. Ray calls it mellow yellow, slow mellow yellow. And we call it Lao Gongxiang here. We use its Chinese name. But those are completely novel yellow teas. And this is something that I love seeing in the world of tea is new stuff happening, new things coming out, new teas being made. And yellow tea is an interesting place to do it in, uh, an interesting you know, area of, of the tea world to be experimenting in because it is inherently so artisanal, because you have to be so meticulous and precise and experienced and, Every yellow tea really is an expression of that particular tea master's skill and process and their relationship with the tea, what they've learned from the tea. And so it's, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's almost, I would say that making a new yellow tea is uh, an act of, of virtuosity from a tea master because they are hard to make and because if you don't do it right, you're basically just making a really poorly processed green tea. You know what I mean? If you don't, you, you don't want it to be so oxidized that it starts to be like oolong. And I forgot to mention this earlier. We think, okay, more oxidized than green tea, less oxidized than red tea. That's oolong. Not exactly, not all the time. Sometimes it's yellow tea. And the difference is that yellow tea is gonna be slightly oxidized, like zero to 10%. Um, it's more than the zero, but you know, no more than probably 10% oxidized, whereas the oolongs will be more oxidized. Also, the process for making oolongs is much more technical and requires many more steps and is much more intensive as far as physical actions being done to the tea rather than just a very a very fine-tuned and sensitive oxidation process actually in a way you could think of yellow tea as being kind of like white tea in that you're not doing that much to the tea the difference is that with yellow tea you are cooking the tea you do sha ching the tea after that meng huang process when it has been yellowed to the appropriate degree, then you will go and uh, sha ching it. You'll cook it either by steaming it or cooking it in a wok, traditional style, and stop that process. So they're allowing it to oxidize just a little bit, then they're cooking it. Very, in, and there's no massaging. So in many ways, what this really resembles is white tea, whereby the skill of the master is all in being sensitive to the tea, timing and knowing when to stop the process. And, and, uh, and getting the ideal conditions around that process. And today I'm gonna to be using a gaiwan, for this second one, lychee gummy, I am gonna be using a gaiwan, and I will be using a, a technique that I like to use for yellow tea. I'll be combining a couple of different novel techniques, or not novel, but specific techniques in this steeping. And I'm using this beautiful uh, snow plums on the mesa uh, by Marie Gardner from Santa Fe, New Mexico. She makes some really exquisite teaware. This is one of her production lines that we got from her. This is the last one left, this one. All right, give my cup a little rinse. And so when you look at this tea, right off the bat, when you compare it with that Huang Ya, you can see that it is much, much more leafy. You see some buds in there, but it's not all buds. And the fragrance is much sweeter compared to the dryness of this Huang Ya. It's sweeter. It's still not grassy sweet like green tea, but it has some more floral notes and maybe almost some dried fruit, you know, really bordering on approaching dried fruit notes. So I'm just gonna warm it up a little bit, give it another smell. And now I'm getting some malty notes, almost like uh, Ovaltine kind of notes from this. And that is, again, something that you start to get the beginning of in green tea, but it is taken a step further down that malty avenue in this yellow tea. And you're getting some of those dried grass notes also in there. I like this tea a lot. This is uh, one of my favorites.
I know I say that on this show a lot, but this really is one of my favorites, especially lately. I've been drinking this tea a lot. And in Guizhou, a lot of people in Guizhou have told me don't rinse Guizhou teas. And so a lot of times I don't. Actually, I was going to do a, a different opening technique for this. I was going to do the Jin Run Pao opening technique, but I didn't. So I'm just going to drink the rinse. You can see again that very lovely yellow color, very much like green tea, except it's not green. How about that? That's kind of a good way to think about yellow tea in general. Very much like green tea, but it's not green. It's yellow. I'm gonna leave that lid off there. Oh boy, you can see. Both are golden in color. This one obviously has a lot more depth of color to it. And I was, you know, using a different steeping technique, so it's not exactly fair to compare it, but. This also has more leaves, and so you're gonna get more robustness, just like at any tea, just like the difference between Silver Needle and Shomei. When you have more leaves, you're gonna have more oxidation, and you're gonna have more robustness of flavor. And then we can see, even in the cup, you get this much deeper, golden yellow hue from this here lychee gummy. Oh yeah, that's nice. Very different, two dip very different yellow teas, but you can taste how they're both yellow tea. If you have not tried yellow tea, I very much invite you to try some. They're hard to find. We've got a couple. We're gonna add a couple more when we get the chance. Lao Gong Xiang, they're not even gonna make it this year, so gosh darn it, we are not gonna have that one. I'm really bent out of shape about that because I love that one, but that's just the thing with yellow teas. They're so produced in such small quantities that some years you just don't even get one at all, maybe not. And uh, But they're a very exciting realm of tea for people who enjoy green tea. I'm one of these people who really, really likes green tea. If you have not tried yellow teas, it's a really, wonderful land to explore because there are a lot of the things that we love about green tea are in there, but interpreted in a different way. And because they do represent this, if you're a modern day tea master in 2021 in China, you are, you know, the next generation after the people who are like, let's scale everything, let's automate everything, let's make everything as um, you know, uh, efficient as we possibly can and make as much tea as we possibly can and make it all homogenized. That was a generation ago. And now we're having a generation of tea masters who are like, no, I want to apply these traditional techniques. I want to be using my skill. I don't want to produce something that is homogenous from batch to batch, from year to year. I want to produce something that is an artisan product. Now you're starting to see some of these ambitious next generation of tea masters really taking this idea of yellow tea and making it their own and creating their own yellow teas. And because it is so idiosyncratic to each master and because there is so much skill and mystery around it, there are going to be many different ways. They're all going to include this Munhuang process, but they will all be in some way, how they get from point A to point B is gonna be a little bit different for all of them. They're all gonna bring something unique to the table. And so I think yellow tea is a very, very exciting world. I, there's two of our yellow teas, our novel yellow teas, and they're two of my favorites in our whole catalog. So if you haven't had yellow tea, go check it out. Thank you all for joining us on another episode of Gongfu Tea Cha, and we look forward to seeing y'all next time. <laughs>